Hi, everyone in the chat. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for helping out. Amanda's here from the St. Martin's. And we've got Blackpool, Scotland, Northampton. See, this is what I love. North, South, East, West, Cambridge, Birmingham, Lancashire. Warwick and Tooting and oh Wales, beautiful Wales, Leeds, Warwick and County Tyrone, lovely beautiful County Tyrone. Welcome everybody. Right, we're at 34 and the numbers seem to have slowed down so I'm assuming everybody's here and they'll catch up. The sessions are recorded so you'll be able to, to catch up on everything afterwards. My name is Cathy Shimon. I'm the Senior Training Manager with Directory of Social Change. Um, a title I resent a little bit because when you've got senior in your title, it either means you've been around too long or you're um, too long in the tooth, one of those two things. Um, I have been at Directory of Social Change, I wouldn't say too long, but a long time. I had my 21st again last year, put it that way. Um, and I'm the I'm a trainer, I come out and visit organisations like yours, I'm a performance coach, um, a facilitator, so I deliver sessions like this and an awful lot of the time, yeah. Um, a couple of things I always start the session with, one um, is a bit of a disclaimer, I cannot know your world like you know your world and when we're talking about things like this it's not always one size fits all so if we're talking theoretically perhaps for you to just be thinking about how would that hang in your context and how might you adjust that theory in order to take action points from it um, and I've got a bit of a guarantee although this does sound like another disclaimer there is no more time yeah if that's what you were hoping to guess as a result of this session more time i cannot give you more time however we can use our time more effectively so i always say if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you always got so i suppose the the session's about just taking away a few practical things that you can yeah um and maybe some of you are working together in the office today anyway so work alongside each other and put your thoughts and your questions and and comments into the chat box for us and um, also hopefully you've all got some sort of note-taking device, whether that's a pen and paper device or a, a, an additional laptop or keyboard type device, do have somewhere that you can take notes, yeah? Um, and again, I repeat the session is being recorded. Um, and Rachel might be able to clarify in the chat what happens with chat and where the chat is shared with you as well, because it's a really useful place for you all to be sharing ideas with each other and resources and references and links and, and all those kinds of things. So do, do use the, the chat and use the Q&A function to put your, put your questions in. I'll stop naturally a couple of times to say any questions at this point, but also I've got Amanda and Rachel helping me there with the incoming questions and comments in the chat. So I'll try and pick up those things as we go rather than just plowing through to the end and, and not responding yeah um so uh i've got one two and three things to mention as well before we we dive in one is that this is one dsc course at directory of social change we do stacks of training for individuals and organizations like yours um, in all sorts of things that you can imagine helps a charity to do what it does um, with regards to finance, law, personal and professional development. Um, two is we've got two hours and this is one course, but I've tried to abridge as much as I can. So I've put in um, as much as I can from the the full day course but this is also a, a two-way thing and while a, a webinar on zoom doesn't lend itself to breakout rooms and workshop type activity and um, thinking about your own context we will do one or two exercises that you can you know reflective exercises and that you'll be able to take away from you with away from you away with you to use in the in the future yeah three um I work in threes a lot, 
I talk a lot um, and at work, especially if we're in the office, I can I can be easily distracted by that and distract others with that. And, it, you know, talking a lot has it has its upside. I can talk on a Zoom webinar and feel like I'm here with you all. Um, and it helps for fun and creativity, but not so much for focus. So I do try and think in things a lot because it's a useful framework just to, to bring that focus. And I can do it with things like three things to do before lunchtime. And three main points that I want to go into an email that I'm really wrangling with, with, you know, what direction to take with the email or what to put in it. And three action points from a meeting. So thinking in threes is really useful. And actually in Greek philosophy, um, three was the number of harmony, wisdom and understanding. So I think it fits really nicely with our um, search for well-being at work and those kinds of things that we're getting a little bit better at hopefully now, yeah. Um, so at the end of the session, sometime later today, soon as you can tomorrow, think of three things that you could do differently in future. Um, at Directory Social Change, even if you come on our full day courses, we're not saying here's a certificate and here's a qualification and here's some CPD. But what we are usually trying to say is here are a few practical things that you can take back to the real world and back to your desk and be able to put into practice in the real world in future. Okay, that's one, two, three quick things. So first of all, as I say, we, you know, we're not in workshop format, but perhaps we can have a quick chat through the function, through the chat function, yeah? Um, and Amanda maybe help keep an eye on this one as well as it's coming through, I will do too. Just at the moment, start the conversation off. What do these two terms mean to you? Efficient and effective. Do you see distinctions, the relationship between the two? How might you define each of them separately? So I'll give you a moment and put your thoughts into the chat, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, and Angela, those three things from the Greek philosophy about three was harmony wisdom and understanding yeah so thorough thorough efficient might be thorough or is am i being thorough if i'm effective any other ideas what what's efficient what's effective what are the distinctions between them productive thanks andrea yeah being productive Efficient to do things in good time, getting the end results. These are all flying through now. Sticking to the plan, effective, positive outcomes, being organized. Efficient can be doing something quickly and effective is something worth doing. I'm gonna stop there. More might come in and thanks all for the, for the contributions there. The little picture on my slide there of the, the, the ball of wool is um, to say quick chat question mark are you going to get involved here so that's just to represent we can sometimes have tumbleweed moments so thank you at the first fence we didn't reach the tumbleweed moments thanks for all your ideas in there about what effective and efficient might mean um for me it, it, zoe yeah you hit the nail on the head efficient is is doing things right being being organized about it using the right processes systems doing it in the correct order logically and so on yeah Effective is doing the right thing. And for me, that's one of the real key things about personal effectiveness and managing our time more effectively. It's to make that distinction about it, not necessarily um, about super systems um, and over complex systems and multiple systems um, and multiple sources of technology and resource and all those kinds of things and um, it's not necessarily a, a, about those things it's not being about being a superhuman being and being as busy as you can in a day to, to get much done it's also not about you know my way or the highway it, it's um it, it's not about just do things one way i suppose it's about finding the things that suit our role, our energy levels, and the things that we're for so effective is the things that we are for. It's doing the right thing. So at any point in the day, how often do I catch myself thinking, is this achieving what I'm for? 
or am I playing, sidetracking, procrastinating, distracting myself, not assessing myself to say I shouldn't be doing this, or not disciplining myself to say I shouldn't be doing this. So I think that, again, personal effectiveness um, and effective time management is about your goals, what your purpose is, and what I call HPAs, your high payoff activities, what are the things that are going to achieve that purpose for you. It's about awareness and planning. When awareness through review, reflection, we'll do a little bit of that today. And it's about developing positive habits. Um, our time management can probably go like this for, for or our effectiveness in our time management can probably go like this for different reasons at, at different times. So it's worth reviewing and it's worth embedding habits that even if we break occasionally, we go back to as the, the staple or can review those habits because things have changed. Yeah. Sometimes the circumstances have changed or the need has changed and we're just plowing on doing either the same thing or the same things in the same way. So sticking with threes, oh, sorry, what, what I wanted to say, it's not about, or is less about, it's not about those over complex prioritizing systems where they've got 10 colors and ABCs and touch it 20 times and put it in this filing tray or that filing tray, all those kind of things. Not that there's not some benefit to some simple systems, definitely, but I don't think it's about having super, um, super duper systems and um, not about being a human being, not about that, that the highway, as I said, yeah. Um, three possible causes, maybe more, but well, you know, we're thinking in threes and I'm, I'm, I'm grouping things in headings today. So what are, what are the problems? What are the possible causes? Sometimes it's a poor or unclear job description. And we'll look a little bit at that um, in, the, in the next few minutes um, without the clarity and direction of purpose. How can we be sure that we are achieving, that we are being effective within our time management um, and with the, the resources that we have? Um, it's the second thing, possibly about our, our personal disorganization and again sometimes we're better at that than others or worse at that than others and sometimes we're better at that than we sometimes are and sometimes we're worse at that, that than we sometimes are which is why the sort of habit forming is that the staple um, really comes into it so there. So we will take um, a, a look at that and we'll look at things like goals and priorities, tasks and diary management, emails, a little bit on meetings and interruptions and, and things along those lines. Um, and then, and, you know, another significant cause can be things like additional work or life issues. Now, a few years ago, I might have been saying things in the class like, you know, if you happen to be moving house or you're going to get married, or you're doing additional studying, or you're planning some travels or something like that. Um, or if within the organization, you're having some restructures, um, or you're short on staff for a while during a recruitment period, or some funding is on hold for, for reasons. These are sort of additional work and life issues that will still always compound our ability, which is why none of us are perfectly personally effective 100% of the time. So, you know, rein in that expectation if that's somewhere where you're coming from anyway. Um, but yeah, those additional work life issues will always happen from, from time to time, no matter what we're doing, and can be additional to personal disorganization or not having clear direction in when we're where we're going so we're not going to talk a huge amount about those things but I said you know two or three years ago I'd have been talking about those kind of situations now we've got pandemics and we've got political and sort of international instabilities and and we always have those things they seem quite magnified at, at the moment Perhaps. Um, so if you have those additional or work life issues, um, it's not that simple time management tips are going to, to fit them, but it is worth thinking about the other things around stress management, resilience, and, and some of the other things you will have been talking about today um, in, in terms of if we've got additional demand, we definitely need some additional resource in order to be able to, to meet that demand. Yeah. So we're primarily going to talk about um, 
job description type issues briefly and then mostly about um, personal disorganisation. Okay, any quick questions at this point? Anything coming through in the Q&A that I need to be alerted to now? And in the chat function, we've just got lots of hellos. Thank you, everybody, um, for, for the hellos and joining us. Okay. An effective could be a quick fix. That's an interesting point. McDonald right at the end there. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah it can be a quick fix. Um, in that it does the job that it needs to do with the resource it has in the time that it has. Yeah, it doesn't always mean that it's not worth a longer term review. So lots of things are worth a review. And, you know, in that crazy world of pandemic and stop, start, go that we've been living in for a couple of years, it's often the case that um, our, our jobs can become un unwieldy, if you like, or we've got lack of clarity around what our priorities might be at the moment, or we've got um, mixed expectations between ourselves and our manager uh, about what those priorities might be or, or what we should be focusing on, what we're here for and what the purpose is and what the challenges are. Um, so I think it's always worth having a quick look first at your job description. So I said I might ask you to do a couple of reflective exercises to, to help get clarity on a few things. So the first thing that I'd like you to do, pen and paper to hand or keyboards to hand, whichever way you're working it, um, can you write up the purpose of your role in one sentence? So mine looks like this to design, sell, and deliver training to individuals and organizations. I could make that long-winded, like organizations in the voluntary sector and not-for-profit organizations primarily, da, da, da. but I'm playing that app Elevate at the moment, which has a brevity game in it. So to design, sell, and deliver training to individuals and organizations, so that's the overall purpose of my job. For one of a few times during the session, I'm going to stay quiet for a minute, give this account, and let you have a think about that and see if you can write that down in one sentence for yourself. Oh, thanks, Isla. help tenants maximize their income. You're welcome to share these. You're welcome to just write them in your own reflections. Okay, so great ones in here as well. Zoe, just words like try. Again, that app elevates. They'd want you to take that, that word try out of that. To affect change, that's really simple, Andrew. Thanks very much. Okay, so you can you can you can see from my example and all the examples that are coming through in the chat. Really clear purposes here, and that you know the more you want it broad but purposeful to stop and reduce evictions. Here is great. You know, at any point in the day, can you look at your activities and say, while I am doing this, what is it doing to contribute to my stopping and reducing? evictions yeah it might be the purpose of your organization might be the purpose of your role and can you think about how that purpose in your role ties in to the strategic objectives and the bigger role vision mission objectives of the organization as well and there we have sort of tied in purpose too yeah. okay do you know how the achievement of that purpose is measured what would your key results look like? So mine, for example, um, I would develop new courses and we might want to put numbers to that. And um, I would respond to in-house training inquiries that, that come to the organization. I would visit organizations like yours or individuals like you to talk about learning and development needs and organizational development. Um, I would have sold and delivered so many 
training days for, for customers and, and within the sector. So again, I'm going to stay quiet for a minute and you have a think about some of the key result areas that you'd be measured on to achieve your overall purpose. So again, if there's any that, oh, excuse me, if there's any that you'd like to, to share um, successfully managing their tenancies, I'm not sure if that's a, a new one, Vivan, thanks. The important thing is, can you define what your key results are? Outcome for clients. You have KPIs, Gary's saying. So you, what are your KPIs and what's the throughput? Yeah, one of the, the measures, Zoe mentions, the number of rough sleepers in an area. Yeah, it's a measure of whether I'm being effective in reducing rough sleeping. Yeah, avoiding evictions. OK, so some really clear measures here. Yeah. So again, these are really helpful. Thanks very much. So thinking about the overall purpose and thinking about the outcomes that you're measured on, what tasks do you need to be involved in in order to be being effective? So you could very efficiently be cleaning up the database of funders, and I'm not saying that's a pointless task, yeah? But you could very effectively be having calls and contacts with funders or making applications. Yeah. So what tasks might you be involved in to achieve your results? So while I love working on things like slides and resources and training materials and neatening them up and <clears throat> finding new quotes or new pictures that I can put into my slides and so on, while I love doing that, these are the things I should be doing, yeah? So I should be creating outcome-based training materials, yeah? In terms of developing training materials, yeah? I should be meeting with the marketing and the customer services team. I should be working with trainers on content and methods. If I'm doing these things, I know that they are all going towards the development of new courses for the public courses programme. Yeah, my key results area. Yeah, I will be creating worksheets, handouts, and slides. Yeah. So some of the fixing up slides is allowed in there. So again, can you write down the key tasks that you're involved in? Kira, absolutely clear, yeah, great. Benefit calculations, benefit applications, charity applications, you know, what you're doing. So all those times we were caught in a meeting for an hour and we really shouldn't be there and it's not that purposeful or all those times where we're just plowing through or got distracted by an email and so on. Again, I'm not talking about seeking perfection, but what, what are the causes of us doing that and what are the reasons? for us doing that, is it procrastination or is it time out? And if it's time out, how effectively are we using our time out? Okay, so again, great, some really clear ideas of the types of activity that we should be engaged in. 
Okay. The key point really is that, you know, any lack of clarity here for you and between you and your manager and between you and your team, if you're a manager, any lack of clarity here is just going to mean difficulty in prioritizing and focusing. If I'm not clear what tasks I should be involved in to achieve what results in order to fulfill the overall purpose of my job, um, then not least of all, it has huge effects on our stress and our confidence, never mind all the other sort of outputs that the organization is seeking to achieve as well. Yeah. So th this action point, you know, not so much um, habit forming, um, but definitely it'll set the right foundations an environment from which you can you know start new habits if we always do what we always did we always got what we, all, we all always guess what we always got and um, so definitely it's worth having a look at having a conversation sorry um, with your line manager um, and with your team if that's the case I repeat over the last few years I think a lot of job descriptions they always did anyway when people stay around for a while or priorities in the organizations change job descriptions change we don't always stay ahead of them and then we either have misunderstandings about what we should be doing or we're just not clear ourselves so the action is write down the main objectives of your job and identify those key result areas Write down the important tasks that are going to help you achieve, achieve those key result areas. These are your priorities to some degree. Um, and review this with your manager for your own job and with your staff for theirs. Okay, it's one way to help us think about priorities. Another useful way um, is to consider what I should be being engaged in at any typical time in the, sorry, at any time in the typical day. <clears throat> so the screen shows that the, ma the mouse has the option to watch TV or play with the teddy bear or sleep or to catch mice. So the cat has the option to catch mice. Um, getting its priorities straight, the most important thing for the cat is that it's fed. <laughs> so its priority for the day is to, to catch mice. What I would like you to have a think about is, now I say this a little bit cautiously, take a typical day. I know we're not in a physical room, but I can almost feel half of you drawing back. A typical day, you think I have typical days? No two days are identical. There's no such thing as a typical day. So maybe think back to yesterday or the day before. You know, you can use your diary to help you. Think of a day that's in recent memory. Yeah, and you can um, decidedly choose a day that didn't go well, that sort of, you know, went off at the end of it, or you can choose a day that, that was particularly productive and successful. What I'd like you to do is create something like this. So it's kind of a page out of a diary on what your day looked like. Now, what I don't want you to do is take a day out of the diary because the day in the diary is not always what the day looked like at the end of it. What I want you to do is take yesterday, if you can, or as close to that as possible, and what that day looked like. Now, I've been, you know, very, very kind on myself. <laughs> Here, yeah, um, in that it, it hasn't included things like maybe, oh, got distracted with the email for 10 minutes, because you can guarantee that was probably in there as well. Um, kids came in and interrupted me because they finished school, something along those lines. Um, wanted to ask somebody a question in work, so gave them a call and then started talking about all sorts of other things and who knew it half an hour went by, yeah. All those kinds of things as well. Include those if they happened. Include those in your diary. And it's not that these things shouldn't happen. We shouldn't stop by and chat to colleagues and so on. But it's just about thinking about what the day's plan looks like and what the day's reality looks like. So you type or scribble away for a few moments because there's a follow-up exercise to this. So if you've got a handful of things in here, 
that look like a typical day. If it's easier, if your work's chunked in a different way, if it's easier to think of a typical week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that kind of thing, yeah, you'll still be able to, you know, use that follow-up exercise. And all these exercises are just a bit of a work in progress today. It's just to show you the kind of review and reflection and consideration that you can do in order to, to look at what, where habits are and where, where priorities are. So we might not get them all, you know, all complete. Sorry, again, to the perfectionists, if you just wanted a theta complete to have this all fixed for you at the end of the day. Okay, so hopefully you've got something on your... Um, whatever racing device you're using at the moment. Okay. Um, questions, questions now? Oh, okay, let's have a look. At this point, I'd like to introduce, and he should be referenced on this slide, so I'm very sorry, um, I think it is at the end, Stephen Covey, C-O-V-E-Y, Stephen Covey. Um, author of a really useful book, The Old Ones Are the Best. Um, the book is called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a really good book if you do tend to go off on tangents, lack focus. You know, you don't want to be a superhuman being, but you just want to make sure that you do get the important things done in a, in a time and in a fashion that doesn't take up the whole of the rest of, of your life. And um, so it's a really useful book in that regard. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This time management quadrant is, is from that book. And what he looks at is that throughout the course of our work, we will have some things that are urgent and important. Um, genuine crises are urgent and important. If suddenly, I shouldn't say this, touch words, if suddenly the um, tech had a problem here, Amanda and Rachel would have an urgent and important crisis that they needed to deal with right now. Yeah. Um, pressing problems, you know, firefighting, things that, that just come up immediately. These are urgent and important. Some things are not urgent. Well, let's come to that one last, actually. Let's come to quadrant three. Some things are not important, but they're urgent and lots of things scream urgency at you that aren't as important as their screaming pretends to be. So some interruptions, some calls that you get from other people, some emails that you get and some emails that you get involved in, in responding to, um, meetings that are prepared or chaired or managed very well. All these things um, scream urgency, but they, they, they're not always important. There is the not important and not urgent stuff. And, you know, I, I test any one of us to say that we don't sometimes get distracted by these things, but the, the not important, the not urgent stuff, it, it, it may be relevant to our role. It's often the stuff that we like doing, like, you know, finding new training materials or slides or, or whatever your thing is. Um, and it can be the, the trivia, like, um, you know, reorganizing new folders in my email box because I'm bored with the old ones not because the old ones aren't working but just because I wanted to do something a little bit creative yeah so you know th these kinds of things um sort of unproductive activities might be not important and not urgent in quadrant two not urgent but but important is where our effectiveness will lie um, so things like planning, relationship building, creative thinking, problem solving, um, preventative crisis management through problem solving, professional and personal development, training. So right at this moment, in this time, you are in a not urgent but important quadrant. Well done. OK, so what I'd like you to do next is think about your typical day that you just outlined and plot each of your activities on here, yeah? Again, I'll stay quiet for a moment so that you can have a think about where you were spending time.
And can you see where things from your typical day or your typical days or your variable days um, and the, the activities that you are engaged in, can you see where they're sitting? And in terms of importance and urgency, and in terms of what your key result measures are and so on, are things sitting in the right place? Does it feel like you're spending the right amount of time on the right amount of things? Yeah. Question, uh, question two, quadrant two is the most commonly neglected actually. Um, we often spend more time in urgent and importance, doing lots of firefighting stuff and pressing problems and so on. Quadrant two, two is your achievement. Quadrant, when we build a relationship, if you please do come and say hello to me on LinkedIn, um, then you'll see my mantra on LinkedIn is if the relationship is good, everything else becomes possible. Um, yes, I like time management and I like leadership and I like all sorts of other things in work, but I really am about the relationships an awful lot of the time. So investing in time in relationships manages so many other problems. It manages me procrastinating. I'll, I'm going to go and have to have a difficult conversation with somebody because I won't, because I've got to say something difficult, but the relationship's good. So it's going to withstand the difficult thing. So relationship building, creative thinking, all those kind of things. Harvesting in quadrant one, so it is useful to be in, excuse me, it is useful to be in that quadrant one. You do harvest and there will be some genuine crises and, and pressing problems. There is some futile activity and that's where we will deal with the sort of personal disorganization and how we can be more assertive in situations and so um, sometimes in order to get rid of some of that futile activity where we just sort of, why am I doing this? Why do I keep doing this? Why do I have to keep doing this? Um, and the, the waste activities, um, what can we eliminate? Or what can we put to times of the day where we're just going to do them in order to take a break or to refresh us to do something else so that they, you know, while not achieving the actual goals of a job, directly connected they're, they're productive in other ways they might get our creative juices going or they might manage some of our stress in order to give us a bit of downtime from from relentless incoming requests and tasks okay um so i guess plot, plot your activities and you know have a think about where you are spending time another quick sort of quick and dirty in the moment way to to think about your priorities is to ask do i have to do this and this is one of those you know where you've you've just got it all coming and there's one more thing come in do i have to do this yeah is it something that must be done or there is going to be serious fallout yeah and i always think about the fallout for the beneficiaries not the fallout for the manager for me for you know is there going to be serious fallout for the beneficiaries do I have to do this? Yeah. Is it me? And I don't mean, oh, it's not my job, get rid of it, put it on to somebody else. But actually, do I need to go and negotiate or delegate? And remember, we can delegate or we can get delegate across. Delegation isn't just about down. Um, so do I have to do this? And also, do I have to do this? Is the thing that I'm actually doing spending hours and hours conducting just the right sorry conducting constructing just the right words in just the right tone of an email do i have to do this or would the this be pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody so i like that quick self-check as well and then again I, I I don't have it as a mantra on my LinkedIn. I'd have too many mantras on my LinkedIn. Um, but I do remember for a good while I did have it as a little you know a little sticky card on or around my desk or, or laptop somewhere and when I did get oh not another thing what else do people want how much more can I be asked for um I would say do I have to do this do I have to do this do I have to do this I can't tell you the answer wasn't still sometimes yes but sometimes it wasn't sometimes there was a way to take this somewhere else or get other support for it or find another way to do the thing okay so little bit of a sum up. 
time management is about goals and achieving and high payoff activities be clear on what you should be doing and know what those high payoff activities are so that you can pin your pinpoint your your priorities um, and write or, or consider reconsider your job description in terms of results required do you you know define those goals and, and get the measurements for them and um, might be a conversation with your manager we'll talk towards the the end of the session a little bit about how you might be able to have that conversation how much time 215 that's not bad okay good questions or thoughts at this point anything coming in just let me have a little look and a pause oh jessica gooding you're almost telepathic smart goals can be useful and who put in amanda brilliant thank you very much amanda put in um the covey seven habits so that links in the chat now as well and if there's nothing else in the form q a no cool and um, then yes back to jessica you very nicely serendipitously lead me on to the next point goals yeah so goals what can we say about goals um i, I have to admit i am somebody that if you ever asked me what are your goals for the next five years? I just have a complete meltdown or rebellion. Yeah, what one of one of the two. I don't know whether I'd be panicking or actively not getting involved. But you know, so so me and goals and you know weren't always great friends. But you know, the power of three and those kinds of things helped me to get a little bit more structured. What can we say about goals? Um, some traditional thinking, and you, you're right, Jessica. These can be really useful set goals around your high, pay high payoff activities that are specific yeah 100 training courses in one year measurable 100 in one year achievable I, I, can i look at the actual number of days i have to work deduct the holidays deduct the meeting times deduct other things and still have 100 days where i could um realistically achieve relevant is it relevant to my job yeah and um, is that goal relevant to the purpose yeah to the key result and definitely always time bound so yeah i do like a smart goal and i think um that they contribute to the bottom line and that they definitely realistic you'll have seen in, in my version of smart i put relevant um, but I, I, often that is realistic. I think achievable is, is realistic. So I use relevant to attach it in, in other contexts. Um, but it's realistic. Um, and is it it's reasonable? No. But do you have some of those targets or workloads that no matter how much you seem to be going at them, you just don't seem to break the pile down? at all um, or it might be aspects of your work or your organization that you have to grow because there's increasing demand for for services or something and you're thinking how are we going to do this with the same resource you know how how do we set goals around that yeah and while reasonable and realistic is is fine and it's definitely workable and that might suit your way of working i also like looking at things unreasonably and unrealistically because it sometimes causes us to see something that we didn't see before so um i worked with a manager once that you know got me to really look at unreasonable goals let me do the thinking with you that she first explains to me imagine your goal is to climb a 10 foot wall how would you go about it you might get ladders if you're five foot nothing like me um you might get someone taller to help you might use ropes sheets you might tie things together 
<laughs> you might build steps or you might get, you know, those um, grips that you use in wall climbing activity. All right, so there's a, a few tasks we can get involved in in order to achieve the goal of climbing a 10 foot wall. Let's be unreasonable. Imagine your goal is to climb a thousand foot wall. Look at some of those tasks. Get a ladder, a thousand foot ladder. Seems something a little bit unwieldy about that to me. But we might have to think scaffolding instead. Yeah. Well, get someone taller. <laughs> Again, the thousand seems to be a bit of a stretch. Um, but could I look at someone with the means to get to higher things? Helicopter pilots, crane drivers, hmm. trampoline people. I don't know. Ropes and sheets. I don't know. I may have to start thinking rockets, human cannons, jet wings. You know, start thinking outside the box. Isn't that the phrase? Um, and steps and the grips for the wall climbing. I could, but actually. I could probably go and get some training in wall climbing. Climbing. The key point here is that in order to climb a thousand foot wall, you have to fundamentally do something different. You can't just carry on doing the same task. I'll just get a ladder. I'll just get a bigger ladder. Oh, it's only 120 feet. I'll get a 120 foot ladder. Oh, it's 140 feet. I'll get 140 foot. It's a thousand feet. Yeah. I don't know if we've got a thousand foot ladder. So you have to fundamentally, you know, or, or do something quite different. So if I wanted to get from 100 customers to 1,000 customers, you know, my old way of just going about, put the appointments in the diary, make the calls, that kind of thing, I can't just fit more calls in. Do, doesn't cuss it, it doesn't do it anymore. So I have to think about, so my manager asked me, what kind of things would you have to do if we said you had to reach a thousand customers and I said well I'd have to have loads of them in one room at one time talking to them about DSC and she went mm, you could couldn't you and I said I could actually so we started to have like visit meetings where we'd invite 30 organizations to come and tell us what their problems were we'd give them some tips and then we'd tell them what resources DSC could use and I got you know hundreds and hundreds of visits in a day now it's you know, I'm, I am a bit of a Pollyanna and I do believe in the eternal hope of, of possibility. Um, I don't want to convey that these things are easily, easily um, adjusted and, and sorted in, in the way that I might be making it sound. But the point is we can do different things. Yeah, we decided we'd have Skype meetings, you know, and I was stuck in this world of traveling to places. And this was before you know, lockdown and pandemic when we all ultimately moved to, um, see, I was even saying Skype, it was Skype meetings then, not Zoom, when we all ultimately moved to Zoom. Um, you know, back then I'd have been, how do I get so many visits in a week if I've got to get to Birmingham and to Leeds and I've got that conference and so on. Fun to change something fundamental as I do, change the activities that I do and set against a really unreasonable goal sometimes sparks the resourcefulness creativity ingenuity just a new perspective to look at things so reasonable is great and it works unreasonable can help to inspire um, or to create if we're stuck um, with with overwhelming goals right i've got a note in the chat here good question donald we can pick this up next time kathy pauses for questions Donald. I have to just scan back and find Donald's question. I'm just checking it is in the chat. Is it way back when? Somebody type in quickly if they don't mind. What time? Yeah. Ah, somebody's got fits and pissed. Spot on, Amanda. Thank you. Okay, um, review and embed habits as things change. It's not overly about complex systems, effective time management, using time management.
Ah, oh, 40 minute walking. I've got it. Sorry, thank you for bearing with me. You must have seen my face going all quizzical there when I was trying to find the um the question. Donald asked, 40 minute walk in the middle of the day, what quadrant? Okay. So what I'd like to talk, jump back to is a quick word on weight life balance. You might have noticed in my diary. Where is that diary? Okay. And I mentioned, didn't I, your diary as it stands at the start of the day doesn't always look like it ends up at, at the end of the day. Yeah, this was a day, it was last week or the week before when we were having nice weather. And I always like to keep these things current. So I would do a bit of a new diary for whatever class I'm doing, if I can, you know, within reason and so on. So I'd taken this typical day. Um, and this, this is relevant to the 40 minute walk in the middle of the day. So I actually took my hours lunch um, and that extended to a two hour lunch. Now a note on work life balance. That's not me cheating work and skiving out of work. Equally me working at six o'clock till eight o'clock in the evening to finish the materials didn't feel like a chore. Work life balance for me is not working nine to five and making sure I have all my evenings free. Work-life balance for me and affordable in my role on in my role on some days is that I can juggle things around a little bit. So I would say 40 minute walk in the middle of the day. It depends on the, the purpose of the walk as to what the quadrant is. If it is procrastination, yeah. And you're not using the walking time productively to think about next steps to, to get you off the mark from that procrastination. It's maybe in a bit of either futile or waste. Um, a 40 minute walk in the middle of the day because it's all been on top and you need to take one hat off, put another one on, you know, come down from the, the hyper a little bit and um, I'd say that is in your importance but not urgent this is important to do those things and we've said a 40 minute walk here Donald I'm assuming you mean any sort of you know downtime all sorts of downtime activities can, can be used here if it's a walk that is while I'm thinking about what's the next best way to do that exercise because i've been doing that one a couple of times and it hasn't quite worked out well how would i do that in a different training session if i'm walking for half an hour thinking that i'd say that's good important quadrant two time so does i hope that answers the, the question a, a little bit um and yes thank you amanda for accidentally summarising the points. Accidents like that, welcome. Thanks for accidentally summarising those. I hope that answers the question a little bit. You know, back to the work-life balance. It's about what, what's important to you. What is important to me is family and outside. Now, my family now are teenagers, so the chances of me hanging out with them on a Tuesday evening is zero. So, <laughs> or often zero, unless they need a lift somewhere. Um, so sitting for a couple of hours having been able to be out in the daytime for a couple of hours suits my work-life balance and on that day I was able to do it I couldn't do that on a training day where I'm training from 10 till 4 but I might find other ways to to, to look at that okay thanks for the questions and then um, let's keep going okay we to, I need to scan back down, don't I, to the, to the slides we were really up to. Okay, yeah, so, so cheesy summary, because I do love a, a, a mnemonic. Um, ambitious goals really set, set us in a different direction if we're becoming overwhelmed with doing the same things in the same way, but not making any 
track with them. So all, all my best ideas of creative thinking to inspire some outstanding and unlimited success. And I guarantee you in the, the couple of years that we worked that way with that particular manager, having more um, visits and doing things on Skype, definitely the results were better and definitely my stress was better and the environment was better for my less travel as well, actually, now I think about it. Um, okay, some things for us to think about with regards personal disorganisation. That's what I want to say, yeah. So um, this, this is, I suppose, a lot about developing habits, yeah? And it, it, it's hard, isn't it, to develop habits when the to-do things come firing at us all day or week and you know, within one-to-ones and from all sorts of directions but we all have our to-do tasks somewhere you might have them on a, a notebook you might have them in lists um, you might have an electronic version in your your outlook and um, you might have 20 different post-it notes pinned around your, your screen and so on and um, is your to-do list in your head is your to-do list in your manager's head? Even more worrying. Yeah. Um, so let's think a little bit about diary management. Yeah. Here's a diary. Looks like it came out of 1998. Yeah. It's just got the basics in there. What it's got in there is appointments for meetings. Yeah. And I've seen diaries that still look like this. Yeah, they're just um, they're, they're just appointments for meetings, and our sort of regular routine or systemized diary management will contribute to a sense of control, a sense of clarity, and keep us focused on on purpose. So, you know, while many diaries might look like this, this one actually just looks it's an appointment book, not a diary, um, and it's appointment book. If you're going to use it as an appointment book, can you also use it as an appointment book for managing tasks with yourself as well as managing meetings with others? So again, you know, maybe fairly basic stuff, straightforward, but it's the other stuff that we don't always put in. So I might put a funding meeting in, but I might not have put in, if you look at three o'clock on Monday, prepare the notes for the funding meeting. Anytime I'm putting a meeting in, so for example, this session today in my diary, even if I were a participant in my diary, it would be three entries in my diary. It would be this 1.30 to 3.30 entry. It would have been half an hour yesterday morning, this morning, even 20 minutes, 15 even, just to think, what do I want to get out of that session? What questions do I have that I'm going to take with me? And it might be 15 minutes appointment with myself in the diary afterwards. What did I get from the session? What actions do I need to take? And then you know, on with my work and my planning. So, so the bits in red are the, the sort of preemptors of bits. It's very rare that just one entry would need to go into our diary by itself because usually something else has to happen before or after it in order for that to happen or in order for it to, to continue to progress. So that also shows us a little bit, you know, if I put in end times where the arrows are, that's how long I'm working on planning an admin or working on the budget on Wednesday. It also shows up some free time. Yeah, it might, might be quite a hopeful free time diary um but our diaries should have at least as much free time in that am i being on not at least along the lines maybe i'm being un unrealistic um the point is is that we should show the free time and we should leave it free yeah if we could do a hands wave and i could see you all wave your hand if something happened last week that you weren't expecting it to happen. Raised hands going up in a number of places through through tech. Yeah, they're all coming in now. Okay. Yeah, so a number of people raising the hand. A number of things, yeah, happened last week. Um, 
that I wasn't expecting to happen. Okay. The week before, did you diary for that? Did you put it in your diary? No, I'm not being facetious, so it sounds like I am. Actually, you can't put in the unknown in your diary. But we do know, don't we, that every single week, something is going to happen that we weren't expecting it to happen. It's reality. It's the real world. We could even get our managers to agree with us on that. We could probably agree with our teams on that. Something happens that we didn't expect to happen. So there has to be some free time in the diary to handle the quadrant one genuine crisis and so on stuff. And the quadrant two stuff should all be scheduled in here. Yep. Planning and admin time. Um, so yeah, it, you know, this shows realistically where and how I'm using my time. Um, it also causes me to estimate in reality how long things might take. Always put the, the end time in, you know, maybe probably teaching my granny to suck eggs here, but you know, a diary entry is not about the start time, it's about the duration time. Um, and it also shows what's busy, what's free. And I think that's really helpful in giving you leverage when you're negotiating with somebody else about what tasks should be done well or additional work coming your way. You know, you can quite assertively say, oh, let's go online together. We'll both have a look at our diaries. OK, you can see I'm busy then. You can see I'm busy then. Actually, that one I could move, yeah? So it's not to be without absolute flexibility, but in the start, it gives you clarity of what to expect for the week. And towards the end, it gives you some flexibility, those free times and those scope to be able to manage the unforeseen that we definitely know about. <laughs> Does that make sense? The unforeseen that we definitely know about. Okay. So um, you can see in here, there's, there's a bit of planning time admin time on monday another sort of tip that i'd throw in there actually is to to say there's a broad rule of thumb depends on your role and and how your how your role is carried out at the desk outside or all those kind of things but generally a good rule of thumb is to take five or ten minutes at the start and or end of every day to review and rework and then maybe take half an hour a week, an hour a week to look on a Monday towards how the week's going, on a Friday towards how next week looks. Yeah. And maybe once a month take a full morning or a good couple of hours to do some planning, admin, and um, stuff that will prevent future firefighting you know is it an email that asks somebody to review a policy or are you responsible for the policy is it review the policy if the policy is is the thing that's getting in the way of the unforeseen thing that keeps happening all the time um another useful um sort of time management approach to the diary is to think in 25 minutes now it isn't done here in this situation um it's called pomodoro technique sorry i'm, I'm sounding a bit sketchy because i've just realized it's not in my slides um and mandarin or you're going to be sharp on this one pomodoro technique um, give us a link if you can. Uh, but the, the broad theory is, is about working in short bursts with lots of breaks. So the idea is that you might work in four, you know, decide the task. I'm going to complete that funding application. Yeah, I'm going to finish that report. I'm going to start the structure for that report. Yeah, and think in um, sort of four times half hour work for 25 minutes, break for five minutes, but work intensely for 25 minutes and absolutely break for five minutes, no matter where you're up to. Meant to be good for all sorts of things, endorphins, um, all sorts of chemical levels and so on, so that we can re-energize, refocus. It also does that thing sort of um, 
neurologically of when we're focused on something sometimes we can become a little bit drilled down like this when we come away from it and forget about it and do something that might be active distraction so for your five minute pomodoro break you know do a crossword or wash the dishes or tidy your desk up or something you know something that's different but is not using the, the same source of capacity and resource and amanda's got that link in there brilliant thank you very much okay i just want to say uh quick comments from amanda easy to manage people's diaries One way that can help is adding planning time and listing tasks so another meeting isn't added when you need this boundary. Fab, thank you. Thank you again. So yeah, um, definitely use your diary as an appointments tool with yourself for your to-do list. Your post-it notes are going to, to get lost. Your lists just feel like pressure, don't they? especially when you haven't ticked them off. I know you get the nice bit when you do tick them off, but when you can't tick them off, it's just that constant, oh, and you know, when you're taking that thing, that item from a list to the fourth list that week, and it still isn't done, get it in the diary, make an appointment with yourself and, and you know, approach your tasks like that. And for all tasks, the habit is prepare this, do this, review this. Yeah, I mean, not, not all tasks, but yeah, quite a few. Um wanted to talk quickly around interruptions. The judgment call, not an obligation. We don't have to say yes. All sorts of interruptions, I think, coming in on a daily basis, you know. And again, you know, we've got physical interruptions when we're in the office. We've got virtual interruptions nowadays as well and we've got technical and technological in interruptions um, and interruptions often come as urgent as important and important and they're not they're a, they're a judgment call and um, when somebody says oh i've got to do this it's really important or something screen you know an email is screaming at you here it is do do this email now look at me i'm really important and um, is it? Are they really important? Is it just something screaming to happen now? Is it someone screaming for something to happen now? So I think they're definitely um, a, a, a judgment call. Um, quick chat. Why don't we say no? when we do get certain interruptions. Now I'm not talking about the interruption that are oh, your service users ringing you for help or those, those kinds of things. That's what we're here for. Um, I'm talking about, you know, the interruptions, colleague, can you just, and um, emails pinging in, and phones ringing, those kinds of things. Why don't we say no? Couple of ideas in the chat function. Politeness, guilt, genuine willingness, want to help if I can. Also, I don't want to see, be seen to be unhelpful. Yeah, we want to be kind and we love to help. Yeah, that's okay. Which one is it sometimes you do it with too kind? No, it's hard to be too kind to somebody. Kindness is kindness. But what we're often meaning is we're being unkind to ourselves no. and we don't say no because we get distracted by the new task Rachel that's me yeah yeah it's it's the next thing oh maybe this is a little bit more exciting yeah yeah we, we want to avoid conflict we know there might be repercussions all sorts of reasons that we we don't say no yeah um if we think about a couple of things again the purpose of our role and always for me, the, the bottom line is 
service to our beneficiaries. Yeah. They're the things that I'd always be weighing up on an interruption um, or repetitive interruptions and those kind of things. Is this in the best interests now of service to the beneficiaries? Yeah. Is this what I should be doing in my role at this time to be of service to the beneficiaries? And again, I'm not saying if the answers are no, step away, let someone else do it. I know we don't work like that, hopefully most of the time in our sector and the reality of the world that, that we work in don't always afford that. But sometimes there are opportunities to, to make judgment calls on these things and to negotiate something different um, and to, to sort of set our own boundaries and, and expectations. So I think summary is sort of three ways to manage interruptions. If you haven't got time to be present for the interruption, say so and negotiate it or do it afterwards. So, for example, we have a thing at DSC. Um, it was it was much more in the in the real office, but we do have it still on on Teams. Um, somebody comes along and says, "Kathy, have you got five minutes?" And I'm at my laptop, and I go, "Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, I've got five minutes." I'm not present. I'm trying to do this thing and I'm trying to do that thing. So we, we'd say, I could give you a rubbish five minutes now or I could come and find you in half an hour and I'll give you a good 15 minutes and I'll bring you a cup of tea on the way. Yeah, the virtual um, comparison these days is probably not too dissimilar. You get a, a Zoom call or a, a, a Teams note that somebody's looking to to answer quickly and say, I'll be back in 15 minutes. And you can sometimes say, do you want to do it over coffee in 15 minutes for 10 minutes? Okay. Second tip, mm, how absolute am I on this? Don't be available to all people all of the time. Now, this is often a real fault of, of managers more than the reporting to, yeah? Um, and they often will do it with, with good intention. Um, I, I must fix it. I must help if you ask for my help. Um, I need to I need to be there. I need, I need to fix this for you. Um, so, you know, new habits might be around setting up new expectations, coaching people to, to solve problems. This is certainly for, for managers. Um, I'm sorry, my jaw distracted. This is certainly for managers. Um, define your, your own new boundaries. Tell people when you will be working, when you won't be working. And the thing is, is if I interrupt you, and every time I interrupt you, you stop what you're doing and you react to my interruption. What will I continue to do? I will continue to interrupt you because every time I do, I get a result. Yeah. If I end up with a new expectation that if I interrupt you, at some point you'll let me know when that's going to be most helpful, I'll probably interrupt you with when can you talk later? When's a good time to talk? Rather than the screaming urgency and emergency um, that, that some interruptions can come through with. Okay. And I suppose the, the third thing around interruptions is use your technology to communicate your availability or not as far as possible. So use busy times, use your out of office messages and um, use voicemail effectively on, on your phone. Let people in your team know tomorrow morning I won't be available or morning, but if you want me, yeah, give people heads up when you're going to be on leave next week and all, all those kind of things. So do let people know when you're available and not available. Okay, we are just at quarter to three. I am going to suggest a three minute break 
what I would like you to do is, well, I'll turn my screen off, your screen's on, so I'll turn my screen off for a couple of minutes. I will grab a drink of water. And what I would like you to do is stand up away from wherever you are sitting at the moment. If you're already standing, well done. That's great practice <laughs> when we're at events sometimes. Um, if you are already standing, move around, get some water, um, take five minutes and rejig your brain and we'll come back to the last 45 minutes with some more tips. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm back. I seem to have brought with me from next door a drummer. There's a musician behind me. So sorry if you can hear a little bit of drumming going on in the background. Jazz is up the afternoon, I suppose. Okay, um, a quick summary of sort of habit forming around interruptions. There we go. Define your own expectations and your own boundaries. So, you know, th things like, when will I say yes? When will I say no? When am I available? And I'm not sure if somebody had said, you know, sort of easier said than done when I was saying about, you know, don't be available all, all the time. For I recognize that for some roles, so for example, in our customer services team, the, the incoming is far more constant than my incoming. But for them, I would say the boundaries are you must take your lunch break. Yeah, I can work throughout four or five hours and decide to have a few 15 minute breaks during that. The customer services team can't necessarily do that. So the habit has to be to, to take your coffee breaks and to take your lunch breaks properly as well. So define your own expectations and boundaries around that and communicate those to others. Let, let people know, you know, take, I'm, I'm out for lunch and communicate that regularly so that they know. Um, and stick to them, which is, you know, sort of the point of the slide there. There's no point in setting up your rule of interruption if you're not going to, to follow it yourself. So stick with them, um, but within reason. I know we're a collaborative, cooperative, sector and that's probably a very common values space for a lot of us um but we're also a, a kind and caring sector so we sometimes need to be kind and caring to ourselves as much as we are to others and um 
you know, deal with things within realistic boundaries and expectations. Let's look for a few minutes at mastering the inbox. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to master your inbox. I will, as an aside, though, let you know that Directory of Social Change do have a short course called Mastering the Inbox, where my colleague George Nye takes you through a lot of the tech functions as well as the, um, you know, the, the practical aspects of managing your, your inbox, but also just some of the thinking around this and how we do tend to be very reactive to it and get swamped and absorbed within it all the time and get distracted from what we're really for and what our purpose is and what our high payoff activities are. So he comes at it from both angles. He also does um, a good amount of our well-being training and things like that. So I know he always throws loads of those side tips and, and, and additional things into, into that course as well. So, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, but I, I can't guarantee that you'll have mastered your inbox by the end of the next 10 minutes. Um, again, what are the problems? Let's have some ideas in the chat again, please, if you don't mind. What are the problems associated with emails and the inbox? So I've said things like, you know, they, they scream urgency, they ping. ping, I'm here, you must speak to me now. What else? The aim is to always have an empty inbox. That is, and that sounds just, I, I have this conversation with my colleague, George Kira. The aim is to always have an empty inbox. Um, I argue with him that some things that I'm working on, I just know the easiest way is to go in, do the name search and find that information. Yeah. Um, but he, he will advocate, if you go on that course, he will advocate the, the empty inbox, I think, yeah. And um, we struggle getting rid of them and we think we've got to answer them straight away and we're not always you know skilled or proficient knowledgeable in how to best manage the technical resource that's available there to us you know how much of our diary management to-do lists activities meetings teams meetings all those kind of things are we incorporating into the whole sort of outlook system alongside our emails how are we taking our emails and attaching them to documents or appointments or elsewhere yeah and knowing what to delete and defer to and what to delegate um yeah i've got a nice little sort of sum up for that in a moment a sort of two minute rule and that Yeah, and if you need an instant answer, ring me. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. Um, I just can't always guarantee that you can get one. But if you need an instant answer, ring is the better option than email. So I think the, the highlights um, for me, one of the big problems with, with emails, Kira, is that we, we email when we could have called. Yeah, we get involved in emails when we could have had a meeting email threads that go on forever and um, we're included or include others in emails for really inadequate reason sometimes or just in case you need it in the future yeah yeah also yeah yeah um, Levin, the tone can be misconstrued emails it's really difficult isn't it if we've to have a difficult conversation with somebody i'd much rather have that conversation face to face um and and we can sort of you know work more authentically with each other than trying to construct the thing that just sounds right and you know where you read an email sometimes don't you and you're thinking oh somebody's really trying to use careful language with, with me here so yeah and um, we, we we do pick it up yeah um so yeah, I would recommend the DSC Mastering Your Inbox. It's a half day, there's stacks of tips. And as I say, George has, has got loads of um, other additional stuff 
that he'd put in there just around thinking about email and those kinds of communications. Three tips, thinking in threes. Anytime you're going near an email, stop and think. Do I need to? Do I need to answer this now? And I said, I'll come to my two minute rule in a moment. Um, do I need to answer this now? Do I need to do something with it now? Is it urgent and important? Must I be in the quadrant two with this email at the moment? Yeah. Stop and think, you know, still on point one. Um, is email the right way to go? Do I call or do when I'm in the office, can I go and see somebody face to face? Can I arrange a meeting with a couple of people? Because I've got that email from them and that email from them and that email from them. Can I just get us all together? clear agenda and outcome for the meeting and make all that happen in 20 minutes to half an hour 25 minutes with a five minute break yeah um okay um second tip managing your emails make it routine and turn the sound off and both those things have to go together um so that ping that tells you every time an email comes in or that flashing um sometimes the nature of your work is you need to see that all the time in which case leave it alone yeah a lot of the time it isn't you're involved in something else and you don't need to see the emails that are just coming in over that hour yeah not not necessarily a lot of the time we don't need to see that thing so turn them off when we can and the routine you know unless your job is responding to emails all day long because that's the nature of the service um other than that can you just look at emails in the morning, just before lunch? When you come back from lunch, if you're in real panic that something terrible might have happened between now and then, and, and at the end of the day, yeah? Um, do you look at them all in the morning, respond to them all at the end of the day? But it, it is about making a routine of it and definitely, get training there are all sorts of ways that we can be more effective that allow for that um with that we can be more efficient that allow for that space to be more effective what i would like to do because we can't gather in the middle of a room and get all the flip charts out and all that kind of stuff that i love doing in a live training room but what i would like to do in in the in that live class there is always um loads of tips in the class from other people so i'm going to allow a couple of minutes for you to think about and then share in the chat any top tip mastering the inbox ideas or suggestions that you might have again this is a great way for you to pick up from other people also for you to share with other people and this will all be captured and summarized for you later so it's if everybody contributes a bit it's almost like we created our own, own handout for this session so top tips for effective inbox management Thanks, Harleen. Yeah, dedicate that time. It's planned for the time. Stick to it <laughs> and make it routine. Yeah. Any others? I'm hoping you're all writing really, really long, useful messages. Yeah, I'm going to give it another half minute, see if anything else comes in. Yes, I love that one, 11 rules, tools. It was a joy when I discovered it, that things coming in, I can move them to another part of my life somewhere, to an, a file or an appointment, yeah? And you can create your own rules. I'm not as proficient with that, Andrea, but yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'm going to read that out, Andrea. Create rules 
For example, Andrea says, if you know most of what comes from Fred Brown is not too important, select keywords or your email and your emails will put that correspondence into a folder. Yeah. So you might know that every month from you know, Joe Blogs, you get an email that is about the forthcoming meeting. Set it up to automatically go in the folder because that meeting's in your diary and you also have a meeting with yourself in the diary a day or so before that where you're going to prepare for that meeting. So during that preparation, you can go to the folder and just have a look at what Joe Lock Blog sent as the monthly agenda for the meeting. Those kinds of things can be done quickly in Outlook, yeah? Yeah, and leave others that, that need time, you know. So, actually, here it is, the two-minute rule coming in. Um, clearing to one pain, great. Set time aside, 10 emails off. Amanda kindly summarising some of the points there into the chat function so they'll come through to you later as well thanks i like the two minute rule this this again the old ones are the best and um, they used to talk about this in terms of paper arriving on your desk but for me this is sort of any incoming thing whether that incoming is an interruption an interruption that is an email an email that isn't really meaning to interrupt but anything that that's incoming yeah so the two minute rule is can I do it in two minutes? Yeah. Is action required? Yes. Do I have enough time and information to do it now? Yes. Do it. Then bin it or file it. Get rid of it. Action required? Yes. Enough time and info to do it now? Can you see my mouse on the screen, hopefully? No. Diary when to do it, an appointment with yourself of whatever follow-up action has to come from you having seen that email, if there is follow-up action. Yeah, diary when to do it. At some point, you'll do it, and then you've been a supply list. Action required, no. Is it junk mail? Just put it straight in the bin. Again, a judgment call on what we want to get involved in because it is useful sector reading, personal or professional development or of genuine interest and stuff that just sounded like, you know, it was a nice shiny object on the side of the race course. Yeah. Um, action required? No. Is it for reading? Do it now. I can't. Diary when to do it. That goes in your planning time. Yeah, the, the quadrant two, planning, preempting, professional and personal development. Can I do it now? Can I read it now? Yes, read it. I think there's a fault in this because yes, read it. I think that arrow, so we're on the sort of bottom left hand of these words now, yeah? Yes, read it. The arrow goes to bin it or file it. I think that arrow should go to diary action. And then you do it because so often when we read something, it does create a, an action, yeah? So there may be an option as well from there to go to, to diary. That's only me messing with theories because they all, all analogies break down eventually. Okay, so there's some other ones coming in. Colour coding your emails. So I have colour coding between different types of training, whether I'm in-house training or, or public courses. Um, I have colour coding for internal meetings and external meetings. Um, I have colour coding for writing undisturbed time and planning undisturbed time. And then I have colour coding for I'm free, but I'm creative thinking. You might catch me at a good time or not. So, so all sorts of colour coding. Yeah, Andrea, thanks. Really useful. Okay. There are a number of things. What's within your control with regards mastering your inbox? The options to alternatives. Is, is it the inbox or is it a telephone? Yeah. Oh, second point, control of the email tag. Take control of the email tag where 
everybody's writing in the tag, but they're not realizing that everybody's writing all at the same time and the emails are all coming through out of time and out of sync and somebody's making a point that was actually addressed and resolved three emails ago. All that kind of stuff, take control of that, whatever way you can, put it into a, um, in, into a meeting if need be. Use things like your signature and your out of office and your also generated responses. Use them really effectively to communicate, you know, what where, where you are, how available you are, and potentially what people's expectations can be for you. So my man might say, you know, I only work these days, but I might sometimes be out training. So you might want to catch a colleague if you want me to get back to you before, you know, within 24 hours. Yeah. Also, you might have certain things that you can um, create emails, that you can create templates around within your emails. Have you got standard things that are sent out monthly? Yeah. Um, or standard responses to people? You know, how much of it can you template and, and systemize? Turn off the notifications they've talked about um, and only check them at specified times, times that sort of suit you and the role or combination of those things and only respond at specified times as well when you can give it the, the right level of dedication. Um, the habits around that then, personal routine. Make your emails purposeful and proactive. Think of things like, can I just put three bullet points in this email? Can I... Um, ask somebody for a deadline where they haven't given one or can I tell them that, that this will be the deadline as they didn't provide one yeah but what can I take control of and <clears throat> be proactive about and what kind of professional training can I get to Im improve my skills in this and then this next slide I just left in because it it was meant to be a funny on Twitter but it actually is a nice introduction to other ways to be assertive and it's just all these um daft things um that the way we might write it i think we should maybe and it could be best and the boss might write yes i know what i'm doing here and this is what i will be doing yeah and we go oh i'm so sorry it was terrible my bad what an awful mistake and the boss says i made a small error Moving on, so sometimes, yeah, you know, emailing like a boss, getting to the points and um, other ways to, to be assertive, really helpful as well. Okay, so. What, oh, I was going to come to what is assertive, but actually, quick words on meetings. Let me go with that. Meetings again. Quickly in the chat, what are the problems? Try and check. What are the problems with meetings? I feel a song coming on. Where shall I begin? It's all the old jokes, isn't it? You know, nobody said on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at meetings. No one had their epitaph. Enjoyed every meeting I ever went to. Oh, poor chairing. Poor chairing is the root of so many problems, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah. Poor chairing, though, while I think of this. It is the chair's responsibility, but I think everybody has an, a responsibility at a meeting to make sure that that meeting is productive. So if the chairing is poor, what can we do to help the chair? Yeah. Or to make the chairing more effective? Yeah. Monotonous voices delivering lengthy presentations andre i hope that's not me today um but yes at meetings it, it's the same thing here's my report da, 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 da. here's my report da, 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 da. <clears throat> and i didn't even need to be there for three or four of the reports you could have just emailed them to me i only had questions about the other one yeah so yeah you what can we do to prepare and follow up oh excuse me firing away on the wrong screen again i'm just trying to scan back to some of the things that came in the chat yeah there can be so much a waste of time um and i think the waste of time is not having clear objectives so going back to that smart outcome if you are creating the meeting and agendas create smart outcomes if you are attending meetings 
influence, try and encourage, request, ask for smart outcomes. So sometimes meeting agendas are written in language like, we'll talk about the new lottery funded project. For how long? To what purpose? What's the point? Yeah. Um, whereas if we defined that agenda outcome as define next steps for lottery funded project, we at least, at least know where we're going. Yeah. Or explore pros and cons of having a lottery funded project. Yeah. It, it's those kinds of things. It's that measurability. Again, if we have smart outcomes in our agendas, so if you can control it, control it. If you've got, if you're the agenda writer, and um, if you can influence it, influence it. And um, if all the conversations aren't relevant, this whole attendance thing. So again, <coughs> excuse me. Um, DSC have haven't always been, have become very good at, um, at, you know, at, at excusing you for parts of meetings. At one point, the thinking was always, well, if you, if you have to be at the meeting, you have to be at the whole meeting, yeah? Now, there's a judgment call on this. Certainly, I think you should make requests to not be at the whole of a meeting, yes? But this isn't about, I only want to go and say my this and then get off, yeah? Um, or I already know it, so I don't need to be there because actually the fact that you already know it could make you one of the most useful people at the meeting. Sometimes might not, but sometimes might make you really useful. So it is, again, a bit of a, a judgment call. But this sort of assumed, if somebody says the meeting's from 2 to 3.30, do I have to be there for all of this? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do this? You know, that question becomes quite, quite pertinent when it comes to meetings, doesn't it? Yeah. Preparation. Um, you know, these are the things that you control beforehand. You can control the chairing if you are the chair. You can influence and support the chairing if you are an attendee with the thinking that we all have the responsibility for the effectiveness of the meeting. Um, and sometimes that just takes, as in all personal effectiveness, sometimes just takes a little bit of assertiveness. Yeah, speaking up, making a request, doing that kind of thing. Quick chat. What does the term assertiveness mean to you? We go five minutes and then see if we have time for Q&A. Couple of people having to leave. Thanks, Lisa. And and Amanda, yeah, Amanda's got done a shout out for any further questions. Um, we're still 28 people out there, so I'm definitely not expecting tumbleweed for the closing question. Assertiveness, a strong communication, yeah. An inner confidence, okay. Being confident in your own abilities. I think being confident in your own abilities helps you to be assertive. I also think being assertive can ultimately help you be confident in your own abilities. Clear and concise, yeah, it's clear messaging, isn't it? It's um, simple, non-judgmental, non-loaded language. Yeah, it's choosing words or choosing jargon, choosing language. So it's also assertiveness is considered isn't it? It's not reactive. Anything else that, that you understand from assertiveness? Getting what you need. I love this one, Sarah. Getting what you need by communicating effectively without being unpleasant. Assertiveness is absolutely a two-way street. It's not about, I am assertive so I can really get what I want. 
assertive is about. I am assertive. So in a situation, I can explore what's needed and define what I will give and won't. Yeah. Being comfortable to say no when we need to, setting our own boundaries, but also that two-way thing, considering others, what are their boundaries? What are their priorities? What do they need from us? Am I playing games here? Am I holding things in my back pocket, withholding information until I can land it and pull it out to pull the rug under somebody's feet, which we do in conflict. We do these things, we're human beings, yeah? Um, it's kind of the opposite of all that, saying what you mean and saying what you need, yeah? Um, in the clearest, simplest way. Yeah, and, and yeah, it, uh, it, it's balanced. It's balanced between my needs and your needs, yeah? I don't have to give up my needs in order to be responsible for your needs, yeah? But I can try and accommodate your needs where possible. And yeah, Kathy, you finish with that sort of, you know, be honest. There's something about authenticity. And I always say it's, it's one of the most amazing words to me, authenticity, because you can, we, we could all say, oh, they were really authentic, couldn't we? We could all describe somebody as being authentic. But when we're actually asked to define it, it is very hard to define. And, you know, without being evangelical, the, the real masters of assertiveness are those that do have um, what we call in coaching an unconditional positive regard for others and their situation and their worldviews. So, you know, in confidence, my mother, she's not here, thinks she's the most assertive woman in the world because she talks to people like this. Yes, I would like, I, I would like that. Yes, thank you. Yes, we have been waiting a while, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. And she just terrifies me and everybody she comes across and she works in a school, she's on the reception, you've met them, you know. Um, but she really thinks she's assertiveness, but I absolutely think it's this two-way street with this consideration toward the, towards others. But there are some really nice sort of um, models and things that, that we can use around assertiveness to help with our personal effectiveness. Remembering that assertiveness is linked to thinking and feeling. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a learned and chosen behaviour. Nobody looked in a pram, in a cot in the hospital and said, oh, look at that brand new born baby, how assertive. You know, it's, it's a learned behaviour and that we can choose to be assertive. We are naturally assertive. We can be naturally assertive. You think of the, you know, the first throes of romance or fantastic relationships that you have with friends. We don't feel we need to be assertive. We can say what we want and make mistakes. And sometimes we might be passive about something. Sometimes we might be a bit bolshy and aggressive about something. We can say things the wrong way. And it's okay because the relationship's okay. And it's, you know, they're ordinary times. Assertiveness is for extraordinary times where we choose to, to behave in a particular way, to protect our rights, to respect others' rights, and to seek the best outcome for the situation. So often what's talked about in assertiveness is win-win, and it's often limited to, ah, to, to get things right, I win and you win, yeah? Now, if I win, that might mean you lose a bit, and if you win, that might mean I lose a bit, and it might also only mean that only you and I win. Think about some of the conversations where you need to be assertive. Oh, excuse me. I've got them here down the side, <laughs> my own screen covering them. Think about these situations where you need to be assertive when you're making requests or refusing, affirming, you know, things and giving feedback or difficult messages, challenging others, managing conflict. We can choose the behavior that we respond to these messages in, yeah? And I think, you know, I've said a couple of times today, respond and react, um, think about the distinctions between those two things. And assertiveness is definitely a responsive approach to some of those difficult situations. Okay, couple of frameworks, if you like. 
for um, assertive models. First of all, saying no, because we, we did talk about that before to some degree um, when I was talking about interruptions and, and, and so on. But some useful things to, to say now, you know, we talked about the reason we don't want to, about being impolite and feeling guilty and so on. But we can actually look good when we're saying no. One, use the word no. I repeat, use the word no. So often somebody says, can you just, will you, would you mind? And we go, oh, I really don't know if, well, possibly, I'm not too sure, well, ifs and buts and maybe. Now, we don't say, no, I can't do it right now. And if you come back in 15 minutes, I could maybe review and see if I can do it then. Yeah. So do use the word no if it's a definite no. Provide alternatives. So this is tied into the, the assertiveness being a two-way thing. So if I have to say no, can I see how much of a priority is this for you? You know, mix, one of the big things about assertiveness is explore the facts first. Yeah. So no, I can't do that. But can I help you, you fix this? Yeah. Can I refer you on somewhere? Can I give you an alternate person, alternate time? Yeah. Or an alternate task to do. And if, if you have good reason to say no to somebody for a piece of work, it should be because another piece of work has a higher priority for your beneficiaries. Yeah. If it's not for the beneficiaries, you might have to ask or, you know, engage with managers or other team leaders or you know people across the organization um, to clarify what what the rationale is for the priority but can you give your reasons yeah and also what are their needs and their priorities so going back to interruptions when you're saying no be aware that sometimes actually you'll be very well founded to say no because what they are screaming at you with urgency and importance won't always be to holding my breath as I say I'm not talking about the calls from people who are homeless right now and or need court representation right now I'm, I'm not talking about swap, swapping those kinds of things I'm talking about working with colleagues primarily yeah um, and also think about am I open to change so you know don't get too far into the habit of saying no, that you're so assertive, like my mother, that you always say no beautifully, perfectly, and very simply, when actually what you could have been doing was seeking alternatives, exploring the options, thinking about their needs and priorities and coming up with a better solution for win-win for all. So I was saying it's often looked at as win for me, win for you, lose a bit for me, lose a bit for you. I win and you win, so that's great for both of us. But in our situations, we often need win-win for all. And there are too many other stakeholders in so many of the conversations we have. I might be talking to my manager about a new training course, but stakeholders in that conversation, you're all stakeholders in that conversation. If it was a funded project, our funders would be stakeholders. The marketing team is stakeholders in the conversation about a new course or, or a new product. So how do I have that assertive conversation and aim for win-win for all, not just win-win for you or win-win for me? Another quick model from... Um, the assertiveness, ooh, flying all over the place, the assertiveness class, um, useful for all sorts of situations, useful especially when something has happened recently or, you know, reasonably um, recently to be called back upon. Um, something's happened, we want to explain it, it's having a negative impact and we want something different to happen in the future. Focus on the facts. So, you might want to say to your boss or be too scared to say to your, to, to your manager, you're always asking me for last minute stuff that takes hours and I can't finish on time. You're always doing that to me. Yeah, that's probably not the fact. Yeah. So if I wanted to have a conversation about that kind of thing going on, I might say to my manager, do you remember last Tuesday when you gave me the report? 
reports for the funders. And then last Thursday, it was the information that we needed for the to go up to the board meeting. Both of those times, I didn't receive those till 4.30, and it meant that I had to work till seven o'clock. On those days, that was okay, but I wouldn't do that always in future, reasserting my boundaries and expectations. Did I just do that? And it's being recorded. Focus on the fallouts. What is the impact of that? Now, you could say, you really don't value me as an employee and you're rubbish as a manager. And the impact is, is that I'm tearing my hair out at night and I'm, I can't get things done and I'm just really stressed and all the rest of it. It's not that those things are not valid. Certainly, if stress and difficult and work life and home life balance and all those things are in any way problematic, find as soon as possible the best person to talk to about that. That might be your manager or some other form of resource in your organization. <clears throat> but in these contexts, you know, when we're raising a simple thing, maybe for the first or second time at a one to one, the fallout is about the impact on the beneficiaries. Yeah. While I'm doing that, I cannot give it justice. I, I, I won't give it the dedicated time and space. I'm doing it in a hurry. Yeah. Or I had to do it first thing in the morning, which meant that I wasn't able to answer all those emails that had come in overnight that we usually do first thing between nine and 9.30. So what is the fallout on the beneficiaries, on the running of the organization, on what the organization's purpose is and what they're here for? Yeah. Okay. And focus on the future. Yeah. Could, what, and sometimes to a manager, it might be a question because that's a gentler, easier way for you to broach it sometimes. What could we agree is the deadline for work submitted to me on, on you know, towards the end of the day? Or will it be okay when you bring me those things if I come back and say no sometimes or renegotiate a new time? You might have said yes twice and had a nightmare last week and think I can't do that again. Well, ask next time, is it going to be okay if I've had that situation and this has been the impact of it? Can I come back and, and ask um, for something different? Okay. Last slide, I think. We're getting there. Oh, no. Quickly, making a series of requests. Let me do a quick time check. We're bang on time. I'm going to leave that slide there. You know, again, just a quick summary of ways that you can ask um, assertively for things, understanding how people you see the world and view the world and what their priorities are. The habits around assertiveness, I suppose, if there's any habit forming, is plan to be a series of most of the time, the difficult conversations that we need to have, we can plan for. So plan it and use the frameworks to help you have that conversation. And again, get professional and personal development training. We do a short assertiveness class ourselves. I also do one-to-one -one coaching, if that will be useful for you. Um, back to threes, take away three things. Between now and tomorrow, think about three things, maybe one thing that you can stop doing because it's not working and it's not making you as effective as you could be. Maybe one thing that you can keep doing because you've had affirmation that you're doing it right and it is working and it's both efficient and effective. And one thing that you could start doing because it was something that you like the look or the sound of that you heard from me or in the chat or, or from one of your colleagues in the sector today. Um, back to my guarantee, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So do think about the things that you can do differently and the further steps are in there. I'm hanging fire. All I can do is thank you so much for contributing to the chat, all your ideas and thoughts and everybody, you've got a 15 minute break now, I believe. And the next session starts 15 minutes after this, the closing plenary. Always really useful time for reflections and action, action planning, the closing plenary. So do what you can to get there. And it's a nice way to finish off your day. Thank you. And thank you, Rachel and Amanda, for all your help.